You know how I posted a video about enterprise SAS RAID on the Raspberry Pi, but never actually showed a SAS drive? And then I posted a video about the fastest RAID ever on a Raspberry Pi? Well, today I'm going to show you actual enterprise SAS drives running on a hardware RAID controller on a Raspberry Pi, and it's even faster than the fastest RAID array I set up before. Josh, a storage engineer at Broadcom, watched those videos and realized the LSI card I tried was way too old to work properly with ARM processors, like the one in the Raspberry Pi. So he asked if I wanted to test a much newer storage controller that might actually work. I said yes, so he sent me this Broadcom Mega RAID storage controller card, along with an 8-bay universal backplane to go with it. And spoiler alert, we got it working. It required about 50 kernel recompiles, and I think I'm getting to the point where I should make a shirt for that. Anyways, we got this thing working, and I can finally say without any caveats that I have enterprise-grade SAS RAID on a Raspberry Pi. But what is SAS RAID, and what makes hardware RAID any better than software RAID like I used in the last video? Well, here's a quick primer. The drives you might use in a NAS or a server today usually fall into three categories, SATA, SAS, or PCI Express NVMe. And all three of these drives can use solid state storage for high IOPS and fast transfer speeds. SATA and SAS drives might also use rotational storage, which offers higher capacity at lower prices, though there's a severe latency trade-off with that kind of drive. RAID, which stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks, is a method of taking two or more drives and putting them together into a volume that your operating system can see as if it were just one drive. RAID can help with redundancy so you can have hard drives fail and not lose access to your data immediately. RAID can also help with performance by allowing multiple drives to read or write data simultaneously. And some RAID tech can speed things up even more with extra caching, or provide even better data protection with separate flash storage that caches write data when power goes away. If you can fit all your data on one hard drive though and have a good backup system in place and you don't need maximum availability, you probably don't need RAID. But for people like me who manage tens of gigabytes of video files every day, RAID is helpful to make sure data is accessible and fast. I go into a lot more detail on RAID in my Raspberry Pi SATA RAID NAS video, so go check that out if you want to learn more. Now, back to SATA, SAS, and NVMe. All three are interfaces used for storage devices. And the coolest thing about a modern card like the one I'm using is you can mix and match all of these in hardware RAID arrays connected through one HBA, or host bus adapter card. Now, if you can spend a couple thousand bucks on a fast PC with lots of RAM, software RAID solutions like ZFS or BTRFS offer a lot of great features and are pretty reliable. But on a system like my Raspberry Pi, I found that software-based RAID takes up most of the Pi's CPU and RAM and doesn't perform as well. If you watched my earlier video on RAID, the fastest disk speed I could get with software RAID was about 325 megabytes per second, and that was with RAID 10. Parity calculations make that maximum speed even lower. Using hardware RAID, where the RAID operations are offloaded to an external card, frees up the Raspberry Pi CPU and allowed me to get over 400 megabytes per second. That's a 20% performance increase, and it leaves the Pi CPU free to do other things. We'll get more into performance later, but first, I have to address the elephant in the room. People are always asking in comments why I test all these outrageously overpowered cards. In this case, a storage card that costs 600 bucks used on a low-powered Raspberry Pi. I even have a 10th gen Intel desktop in my office, so why not use that? Well, first of all, if you've watched this channel at all before, you know my first response. It's fun, I enjoy the challenge, and I get to learn a lot since failure teaches me a lot more than easy success. But with this card, there are two other good reasons. First, it's great for a little storage lab. In a tiny corner of my desk, I can put eight drives, an enterprise RAID controller, my Pi, and some other gear for testing. When I do the same thing with my desktop, I quickly run out of desk space. I don't have the space or time to set everything up and play around with it as much as I do with the Pi. And second, as I mentioned before, using true hardware RAID takes the I.O. burden off the Pi's already slow processor. Having a fast, dedicated RAID chip and an extra 4 gigabytes of DDR4 cache for storage makes the Pi reliable and fast for any kind of disk I.O. If you don't need to pump through gigabytes per second of data, the Pi and a RAID storage controller is actually more energy efficient than running software RAID on a faster CPU. I tested my storage setup plugged into a kilowatt and the Pi with the card only used 10 to 20 watts of power. 
On the other hand, my Intel i3 desktop running by itself with no RAID card at all idles at 25 watts and normally runs at 40 to 50 watts when in use. That said, I, I don't see this Pi Hardware RAID solution taking over the storage industry and winding up in Amazon's data centers. The Pi just isn't built for that. But I do think this is a compelling storage setup that was never really possible until the Compute Module 4 came along. Now, let's talk a little bit about the RAID controller card that Josh sent me. The card is PCIe Gen 3.1 and supports eight lanes of PCIe bandwidth. Unfortunately, the Pi can only handle one lane at Gen 2 speeds, meaning you're not going to get a full 6 plus gigabytes per second of storage throughput on the Pi. But the Pi can use four fancy tricks this card has that the SATA cards I tested earlier don't have. First, it has a powerful SAS RAID on chip, which is a computer in its own regard, taking care of all the RAID storage operations. This frees up the host computer, in our case a Pi with a slow CPU, from having to manage RAID operations. Second, it has a 4GB DDR4 SD RAM cache, so it can speed up I.O. on slower drives, and the card doesn't have to use any of the Raspberry Pi's own limited RAM. Third, it has a thing called Cache Vault Flash Backup. If you buy an extra supercapacitor and there's a power outage, it dumps all the memory in the card's write cache to this little built-in flash storage chip. Fourth, it has what's called tri-mode ports, meaning you can plug any kind of drive into the card like SATA, SAS, or even NVMe, and it will automatically switch modes to work with that drive. It also does all the work internally, so using multiple NVMe drives won't bottleneck the CPU, which can even be a huge problem with faster processors than my Raspberry Pi has. I don't have a U.2 or U.3 NVMe drive on hand to test right now, but maybe that'd be a fun topic to explore in a future video. Oh, and did I mention it can connect up to 24 NVMe drives or a whopping 240 SAS or SATA drives to the Pi? My budget right now is a little bit limited, especially after that nearly $1,000 Wi-Fi 6 testing video, so I've only been able to test 8 drives at once so far. Maybe if this channel ever hits a million subscribers, I'll budget for a giant 240 drive Raspberry Pi petabyte NAS. Anyways, I'm getting off track. The goal was to see if a newer card, which was designed in an era where ARM processors on servers were a thing, could work on the Pi's limited PCI Express bus. The first try was pretty rough. Right out of the gate, Josh sent over a driver that I had trouble compiling. I also realized the card needed at least 10 to 20 watts of power, and the 2 amp 12 volt power supply I was using with the compute module was probably not adequate, so I replaced it with a 5 amp power supply. I should note I also tried using external powered risers, but there are two reasons I didn't use them here. First, one of those risers released the magic smoke in one of my network cards a few weeks ago. And second, when they do work, they only work some of the time, so it's kind of like Russian roulette if your storage comes up when you boot the Pi. So I chose to increase the amperage to the compute module board itself, which allowed the card to run without any issues. With the power issue solved, I tried getting the card's driver to compile on the 64-bit PiOS beta, but I ran into more problems. I had to build the kernel headers myself since at the time, the Raspberry Pi kernel headers package wasn't available for the beta OS. After I got that figured out, we found MSIX wasn't supported on Raspberry Pi OS, but the card needed it to load the driver. It was a happy coincidence that some other people who are trying to get Google's Coral AI accelerator working had the same issue we did. And lucky for us, in a forum post, Phil Elwell mentioned he committed a tweak to the Raspberry Pi kernel source to enable MSIX with a few little limitations. So it was time to compile a new kernel. Well, we did that, but ran into some other issues with the driver, so the bring up was on hold. I also tried compiling the driver in Ubuntu's 64-bit server edition for the Pi, but ran into the same MSIX issue and I wasn't really set up to recompile the Ubuntu kernel. After a little time passed, a new driver version was sent my way and I recompiled the kernel so I'd have MSIX support. I compiled the driver with a new kernel and then got a bunch of messages about IRQ poll features not being defined. Apparently, I had to recompile the kernel again, this time configuring it with the option config IRQ poll set to Y. So I did that and copied the kernel from my fast cross-compile environment on my Mac to the Pi, then found out the kernel headers and source required by the driver weren't compiled for ARM when I built the kernel on my Mac. So guess what? I had to recompile the kernel yet again, this time on the Raspberry Pi itself. An hour later, with the Pi compiled kernel, the driver compiled without errors for the first time. I excitedly ran sudo insmod mega raid sas.ko and then 
it hung. The driver initialization just failed after hanging for five minutes or so. And at this point, I knew things were serious because we had two other Broadcom engineers on a conference call and they told me to pull out a USB to UART adapter and watch the serial data coming off the card itself while it was initializing. I got to learn a bit about Minicom and debugging Broadcom cards, which was neat, but after a few hours, we found that the driver would work on 32-bit PyOS, but not on the 64-bit version, which is a little strange since many drivers support 64-bit PyOS better than the 32-bit PyOS. Anyways, we dumped a ton of memory data to text files. I sent that data over to a driver engineer at Broadcom, and finally, a few days later, he sent a patch which fixed the problem on 64-bit PyOS, which turned out to be related to the use of the write queue function, which is apparently not that well supported on the Pi's PCIe bus. And so, after many recompiles and a lot of iterations of the driver for this card, we got it to work. When the card initializes, dmessage shows that the Broadcom Mega Raid driver can see the attached storage enclosures, and then I can use an app called StoreCLI to interact with the card and configure Raid. I'm not going to get into the details of using StoreCLI since you could write a book on it, and it looks like Broadcom has already. But the process for setting up a volume went like this. First, I used StoreCLI to create a virtual drive using this command. The command makes a RAID 5 array named sasr5 using drives 4 to 7 in the storage enclosure I have attached, which has an ID of 97. It sets a few options for setting up caching and then sets the strip size for the RAID array to 64 kilobytes. Depending on the type of drives you have and the performance options you need, you might want to use a different options here, like a larger strip for slower spinning drives. Like I said, there's practically a book on how to set up RAID with StoreCLI, so if you're serious about it, you should probably read that. After I created a RAID 5 volume for my four Kingston SA400 SATA SSDs and another one for four HP ProLiant 10K SAS drives, I used LSBLK to make sure the new devices, SDA and SDB, were visible on my system. Once I knew Linux could see these volumes, I partitioned them with fdisk and then formatted them with makefs, and boom, I had two new RAID volumes, a 333GB SSD array and an 836GB SAS array. I also wanted to make sure the storage arrays were available at boot time so I could do things like automatically mount them and share them via NFS, so I installed the compiled driver module into my kernel. I copied the module into the kernel drivers directory for my compiled kernel, then I added the module name, megaraid underscore sass, to the end of the etsy slash modules file with t. Finally, I ran depmod and rebooted, and after boot, it looked like everything came up perfectly. One thing to note is that a raid card like this can take a minute or two to initialize since it does a full boot process on its own. So boot times for the Pi will be a little longer if you want to wait for the storage card to come online first. Now it's finally time to unleash the beast. Before I turn everything on again for some performance testing, I guess I should mention that the easiest way you can tell if something's designed for enterprise use is how loud the fans are when you turn the thing on. 90 decibels, that's impressive. Don't run this thing right next to your head on your desk for eight hours, or you might get permanent hearing damage. I think I can hear some viewers from r slash home lab shouting, what did you just say? Over the noise of their rack mount servers posting. Anyways, for these tests, I'm using four Kingston SA400 SSDs, two are 240 gigabytes, and two are 120 gigabytes. Why? Because I'm cheap and that's all the extra SSDs I have. I'm also using four used HP 300 gigabyte 10K SAS drives, and how do I know that they're used? Well, just listen to the things when they're active. I, I don't think it's normal for a hard drive to make its entire drive tray physically move when it's doing heavy write activity, but it is normal for these guys. So with this thing fully online and operational, I threw some tests at it using FIO, which is a commonly used IO testing utility for storage devices. The first test was running one megabyte random reads, and that showed 399 megabytes per second on the SSD array and 114 megabytes per second on the SAS array. Then I did one megabyte random writes, and that gave me 300 megabytes per second on the SSDs and 98 megabytes per second on the SAS drives. These results show two things. First, even cheap SSDs are still faster than spinning SAS drives. No real surprise there. But second, the limit to the SSD speed is the Pi's own PCI Express bus. In testing a few different network cards, I was able to get between 3.2 and 3.3 gigabits of network bandwidth. 
With the storage controller, I'm able to get 3.35 gigabits of bandwidth, and that's actually better than the bandwidth I could pump through a 10 gig network adapter, which could only get up to 3.27 gigabits. There are tons of other tests I could do, but my main intention this month is to see how a bunch of different options fare for network storage, so I next installed Samba and NFS to run some benchmarks. I was kind of amazed that both Samba and NFS got almost wire speed for reads, meaning the Pi was able to feed data to my Mac as fast as the gigabit interface could pump it through. If you remember from my SATA RAID video, the fastest I could get with NFS was around 106 megabytes per second. And that speed would fluctuate when packets would get queued up while the Pi was busy sorting out software RAID. With the storage controller handling the RAID, the Pi was staying a solid 117 megabytes per second continuously as long as I was copying things across. Write speeds are a little bit lower, but not much. Using the RAID storage controller freed up the Raspberry Pi so it can transfer data over the network at full speed with no bottlenecks at all. And at this point in the video, I was going to plug in a PCI switch so I could plug in a 2.5 gigabit LAN card and the storage card at the same time to see if I could blow past the 117 megabyte per second limit. But I ran into a problem. It seems like both of my PCI switches couldn't provide enough power for both cards using my 2 amp Molex power supply. So I pulled out my big 600 watt PSU and was hacking a connector together to make it easier to tell the PSU to turn on, since I don't have it attached to a real PC with a power button. Well, unfortunately, I released the PSU's magic smoke. The sad thing is, I can't even blame this one on Redshirt Jeff. Anyways, because of that, I can't power up both the network and storage cards at the same time, so for now, you'll have to wait to see how the Pi gets on as a 2.5 gigabit NAS. And maybe support me on Patreon or GitHub, or click that applause button on YouTube. If I can get the funds, I'll be able to replace this power supply for my next video. So to wrap this up, I finally got true hardware SAS RAID running on the Raspberry Pi. I can't say I was the first person to do it though, because that honor belongs to Josh, who got the whole setup running on 32-bit PiOS before me. Am I going to recommend you go buy this $1,000 storage controller for a homemade Pi-based NAS? Maybe not. But if you do want high-end storage on the Pi, there is a lower-end version you can get, the 9440-8i, which should still work, and it's less than 200 bucks used. You have to make sure you get the right cables to work with your drives or storage enclosure, though. But even that might be overkill if you just want to build a cheap NAS and use only SATA drives. I'll be covering a more inexpensive NAS setup this month, and I'll go into more depth on new storage standards on the Pi in upcoming videos, so make sure you subscribe. And if I can get 2.5 gigabit networking working with a new power supply, I'd love to see if there's a way to contain that, the storage controller, and the Compute Module 4 all inside a storage backplane like this one. Until next time, I'm Jeff Gearling. I have a link in there. I almost started reading the link. That's nope. I said yes. I sure did. If you have a GAD backup system. I found that. Uh, uh, oh, I don't know what I found. That's a long sentence. Wow. So I installed the compiled kernel module into my driver. I installed the kernel. I installed the what? It is so hard to say megabytes. I hate that word so much. Packets would get queued up while the Pi was busy. Biz, 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 while the pie was buzzing. Hey, hey, remote control work. There you go. Thank you.